Well, let's learn. All right, good evening. Good evening, everyone. Thursday night, let's address uh, our Medrash here. Um, the subject that I want to address tonight, or really that Rosh Hashiva again addresses, let me again mention it from the very get-go, that the Torah that we're sharing is the Torah of uh, my Rosh Hashiva from Karen B'Yavner, of Chaim Yaakov Goldvich. Um, it is all his, and I give him all the credit, just have the privilege of presenting it. Uh, one of the most enigmatic discussions that the Torah has is the wrestling match that Yaakov has with the Ish, with this man, which Chazal uh, identify as the angel, the administering angel of Asaph. Let's take a look at the Psukim, and then we will tackle the first Medrash for tonight. The Psukim describe uh, Yaakov, of course, is on his way back after spending some 20 years with his uncle Lavan. He's now headed back to the land of Canaan, back to his homeland, the land where Yitzchak and Rivka, Avram, and, and Sarah were. Now that they are all alive at this point, he's coming back to meet up with his brother Esau, which is as the Pasha begins, where he sends all of the gifts and he tries to make peace with his brother. And uh, he, <clears throat> the Torah describes, has his entire family with him. And the Torah takes us through as he arrives uh, uh, in the land, Vayakam Balayla Hu, this is right before his big meeting with Esau, Vayakam Balayla Hu, he gets up in the middle of the night, Vayikach Ashtay Nashav Yashtay Shiv Chosav, and he takes his two wives and his two uh, maid servants, his four total wives that he has, his 11 sons, and they cross over this ma'avar, this uh, wadi of water, uh, to get to the other side. He takes everything that he has, and they cross over. Then Yaakov is left alone. A man came and wrestled with him, Adalos HaShachar until the first ray of light of the morning. That Pasuk highlights, even though we are told that Yaakov is in the midst, he's got a big group with him. He has his wives, his children, all of their cattle, the flocks, all of the things that they have, and he's with them because he's literally taking them from one side off to the other side of the small little river. And then somehow he's left alone, Yaakov. Yivaser Yaakov levado. And a man comes and wrestles with him, as I mentioned, Chazal, and identify this not as a regular person, but as the Saro Shal Esav, the angel of Esav, and they wrestle until morning. Bayar Kilo Yacholo, and this angel, this man, saw that he was not able to defeat Yaakov, Vayiga Bekafi Recho, but he is able to literally to touch uh, his hip, Vatika Kafierach Yaakov, and that hip joint. Uh, will translate loosely, is uh, uh, dislodged of ko imo in the wrestling match. And the Torah goes on to say, this is why we do not eat the gid hanasha, the back sinew of animals, of the, of the hind legs, in reference and re in remembrance of this particular wrestling match. There's so many aspects of this that need to be addressed. What were they exactly wrestling about and who this person was? Why only specifically until morning? What's the symbolism of that we were damaged but that we were never permanently uh, able to be defeated? Much discussion. What we're gonna highlight tonight is the fact that Yaakov is left alone by Yuvaser Yaakov Livado. The Medrash points this out. Now, we could address when somebody's left alone, we could address that on many different ways. Is it a good thing to be by oneself? Is it a, is it a situation of stature that one is all alone? Does it mean that they were forgotten about and it's almost just the opposite of a place of stature? What are we to make of the fact that Yaakov is left alone in this moment? So the Medrash says as follows in source number two, by Yuvaser Yaakov Levado. Yaakov was left alone. The Medrash connects this Pasuk of Yaakov being by himself to another Pasuk that we have at the very end of Sefer Devarim, where Moshe is giving his final blessings to the people, and at the end, uh, to, the, to, to the 12 different tribes, and at the very end, we read this in Parshish Bezos Sabracha, after he goes through all 12 of the blessings, he then says, Ein ke'el Yeshurun, he says, Oh Yeshurun, the, the Jewish people of Yeshurun, there is no God like your God who rides through the heavens to aid you and to help you. There's no God like Yish O Yeshurun. And the simple meaning Yeshurun is a reference to the Jewish people. And the Medrash picks up on that opening phrase, there is no one like our God, Yeshurun. As if you can read it as, the Medrash says, there's no other God. 
But if, if you wanted to know what is the most similar, what is the closest, umi ke'el, from the language of ke'el, like, who do we have in this world that is like God? Yeshurun. Yeshurun is the closest thing that we have. And what's Yeshurun a reference to, the Medrash says? Yisrael Saba. Our Zaydi Yisrael, specifically Yaakov. So that the Medrash reads the Psukim, there is nothing like Hashem. But if you want to know what's the closest, that would be Yaakov. We actually have other references in our Parsha where Hashem himself calls Yaakov also in some godlike terms. But uh, for now, let's just focus in what way is Yaakov godlike? In what way is he ke'el, similar to Hashem? So the Medrash says, Ma Kodesh Baruch Hu Kosov, but what does it say in reference to Hashem? The Niska of Hashem Levado. Hashem alone will be exalted by Yom Hahu. On that day, the Pashuk in Yishayot says, all of the haughtiness of men will be cut down. And what will be left? The of Hashem levado by Yom Hahu. On that day, the only thing that will be exalted will be Hashem. And the language of the Pashuk is Hashem levado, alone, by himself. Well, that's the exact same phraseology we find by Yaakov Avinu. Av Yaakov, it says, Vayivaser Yaakov levado. Yaakov was left alone. So whereas we might have thought to read Yaakov's being left alone as something negative, that he was left all by himself, the Medrash says, Vayivaser Yaakov levado, that Yaakov was by himself. Hashem is described in the same way. The Niska of Hashem levado. Hashem is exalted alone. There's a comparison. The closest thing that we have to Hashem is Yisrael Saba. He's like, in a, in a certain way, he's like Hashem himself. He reflects some sort of godliness in being alone. Now, those who are familiar with these psukim, Shlomo Karbach put this medrash together in a song. Meniska, Veniska, Vashem Levado, Vayivaser Yaakov Levado. Putting these two, it's a medrash that puts these two ideas together. Shem is alone, Yaakov is alone, and that's an exalted status. What was Yaakov actually doing alone at that moment? So here we have a very famous Rashi. It's really a Gemara that Rashi quotes. What's Yaakov doing alone? If you were to tell me that there was something that Yaakov did alone that would make him analogous in some way to Hashem, I would have said he spent years learning in the yeshiva of Shem Ve'eder, sitting, immersed himself in yeshiva. He was studying Torah. I would have said maybe in that way, he in some way embodied or reflected a godly spirit. Or the 20 years that he spent with his uncle Lavan, in Lavan Garti, Vitayag Mitzvah Shamarti, even though I was with a person like Lavan, I maintained my spiritual stature. I didn't drop an iota, despite the fact that my surroundings were very complicated. Maybe that would be a reflection of godliness. Maybe it was actually in this wrestling match in which he emerges we could say undefeated. Maybe that's a reflection as the, as the, the angel then names him Yisrael. You fought with angels and you were able to. Maybe that's a reflection. But the Pasuk says it not on any of those things, not in his learning in the yeshiva of Shem Ve'ever, not being with Lavan, not even wrestling, in being alone. What was he doing alone? So the Medjid, the Gemara says, Gemara says in source number three, He had gone back. The Pusik says he took all that he had and he crossed over this river, all of his wives, all of his children, all of his animals, everything is on the other side. What's he doing alone? So the Gemara says he went back for that which would be considered insignificant. It doesn't even make its way into the list of things in his psukim. Pachim ketanim. We use the word pach, it's going to be Hanukkah next week. A pach shemen, a small little flask. He had a couple of extra toothbrushes that he had forgotten behind, a couple of dishes, a plate, a fork. He had forgotten them behind. Everybody forgot them behind. They picked up their stuff. They packed them up. They went. And Yaakov said, I left some things back. There was a couple of plates and a toothbrush that I have to go back for. And so he went back by himself. Mikan, the Gemara concludes, Mikan le tzadikim, shechaviv aleihem mamonam. You see that from here, the tzadikim, their money is so dear to them. Yoser migufam, even more than their own physical bodies. Yaakov puts himself in physical danger to go back all by himself just to get a few little things. Why should it be so valuable, these things? Who cares about them? Just leave them. 
Because the tzaddikim are never involved in thievery. If they have something, they got it through honest means. Everything that they have, every possession that's theirs is an honest to goodness possession that they have paid for. They've worked to earn the money to buy. It's theirs. They don't want to squander anything. That's a beautiful idea not to waste any money. But here Chazal are not only saying that it was worth it for him to put himself in danger to go back, but that in that moment of being back, that's a godly reflection. Hashem is the niska of Hashem Levado, will be exalted alone on that day. By Yavosir Yaakov Levado, and Yaakov is left alone. And somehow in this, we have this connection, a comparison to Hashem and going back with, for these pachin ketanim, which leaves us with the questions of, why does he go back at all for these pachin ketanim? What's so special about that, that in that specific, we compare him to Hashem? Let us start. So in order to really address this, we need to address this on two levels. Number one is, what does it mean, v'niska v'ashem levado? That Hashem himself will be levad, will be alone. And then when we understand what that reflection is of the aloneness of Hashem, then we will see Yaakov's going back for his pachin ketanim, for his small little vessels, and hopefully have an understanding into this medrash, the insight that Chazal uh, want us to have. The Rosh Hashiva began the discussion with a Pasuk that we begin Simchas Torah with. It's a Pasuk in Sefer Devar, in which Moshe says to the Jewish people, source number four, Ata Haresa Ladas, you have revealed yourself, you have shown yourself to us. When you gave us the Torah, you literally revealed yourself to us, Ladas, so that we should know, Ki Hashem Hu HaElokim. That Hashem, you are the Elohim, a phrase which we say, of course, at the end of Yom Kippur seven times. Hashem, hu ha'elokim. Hashem, hu ha'elokim. You revealed yourself in that manner. Har Sinai, that moment of revelation was so crystal clear. You let us know, ki Hashem, hu ha'elokim, ein od milvado. There is nothing else other than him. Nothing than Hashem himself. There is nothing else. Ein od mil vado. Now the phrase ki Hashem hu ha'elokim is a phrase which means he is the all-powerful in control. Everything that goes on, he's aware of and influences what's left by that phrase of saying ein od mil vado. There is nothing else other than Hashem. I'd like to share with you a, uh, a passage from the Nefesh HaChaim. The Nefesh HaChaim was a, a sefer written by Rabbi Chaim Velazhener, student of the Vilna Gon. It's in essence a, a beginner's book of Kabbalah that he wrote, not for the Hasidim, which is where the Baal Hatani was written, but it was a book of Kabbalah for the yeshiva world in which the Vilna Gon, the Misnagdim, and Rabbi Chaim Velazhener uh, lived in. And uh, it is a very esoteric, it's a complicated sefer. And uh, there's a small a passage that we're, uh, I'd like to share. I do so with the following introduction, which he gives. And that is, he writes, this passage that I'm about to write about, one must be very careful not to study too carefully, he says, because it's so complicated and so deep and so esoteric that it's not safe to be involved. And he quotes the Mishnah from Pirkei Avos that the, the bite of the, the, the words of Chazal are like a flame and the bite is the bite of a fox. It says you have to be careful when you are addressing deep and mystical concepts. So he shares more than what we're going to learn together. But I just share that the, the words that we're going to be studying are clumsy to understand the concept. And we're going to just pull from it the little that we can understand um, for our purposes tonight. And the specific topic is the idea that we refer to Hashem as Hamakom, the place. Hashem is referred to as Hamakom. The first, one of the places where we see that in the first line in source number five, in Pirkei Avos, it says, Ukisha Atom is Palel, when you daven, Al Task Filascha Keva, do not make your tfila like a set, like a rote, with no heart, no feeling, no emotions, you're just saying the words. But you should be filled with supplication and beseeching Hashem before the way the mission refers to Hashem is before Hamakom. Now we're familiar with several other places where we refer to Hashem as Hamakom. The most famous probably is when we take leave at a Shiva house and we offer words of condolences and we say, Hamakom Yinachem Eschem. Hashem should offer you, bring you comfort. And we refer to Hashem as or at the Pesach Seder, we say, Baruch HaMakom, Baruch Hu, blessed is Hashem, but we refer to him as, uh, as HaMakom. 
We say in, in Tachnun, um, we refer to many times Hashem as Hamakum. Why is that? What is the concept of referring to Hashem as Hamakum, the place? So Ramazuch Zal, the Tevas Hamakum, the Inyan Gadol, says Reb Chaim Velozhener in Snefesh Chaim, a, a, a very significant and deep mystical concept that we refer to Hashem as Hamakum. Pirshu be gracious Rabbi, he quotes a Medrash, Vayifka Bamakom, when Yaakov arrives in, uh, in his dream with the ladder, he arrives in the place, referring to the Har Habayis where the Beis Hamikdash eventually will stand. And he quotes the Medrash, Mipnei ma mechanin shmo shal kodesh baruchu v'koyren oso makom. Why do we do that? Why do we refer to him? So I have it underlined. So the Medrash answers, Shehu mikomo shel olam, because Hashem is the place in which the world exists, the ain olamo mikomo. And it's not that in the world is his place. It's not that there's a world and he's in the world. It's that there's Hashem and the world is in him. He is mikomo shel olam. Now, again, as I said, the words are going to be a little clumsy to try to understand this concept. So I'm, I figure the best way to do this is to read his words and try to understand them as best we can. Habore Odin call the, the, the creator, the master of everything, who hamakom ha'amiti. He is the place, hasovel nekayim ha'olamos v'habrios kulam. In him, so to speak, is what stands all of existence, all of creation. Meaning, if heaven forbid, he would remove his strength from them for one moment, everything would disappear. The moment Hashem doesn't will it to exist, it would absolutely cease to exist. As we say, you give life to everything. This is the foundation of all Amuna. The world exists, so to speak, in the place that Hashem created. I once heard a marshal to explain this idea in which if you would imagine a person having a dream, and in their dream, there's a whole set of characters, people. And the people in the dream are having conversations, as often happens. And they have lives, and they have feelings, and emotions, and experiences. And then one of them says, you know what I just realized? We're a figment of that person's dream who's sleeping. If he wakes up, we're gone. We don't really exist. We exist only in the dream of that person who's sleeping. And we need him to continue to dream for us to exist. We are, so to speak, all of us, the world, the physical world that was created. And when I say we, if you've seen some of the videos that have been put out recently, they're amazing that describe how small the earth is in the spectrum of the universe. There are these awesome videos that describe, you know, all the different planets and the solar systems. And, and when you see how large the universe is and how small planet Earth is, and then we are, that whole universe exists because Hashem wills it to exist. The who mikomo shall olam. And we exist, so to speak. He is the place in which the world exists. And if you would cease for a moment to give it existence, it could not continue to exist. Continuing on in the words of Reb Chaim. Second paragraph. Virak machma she'ein bekoch shum nivra. Just because we, we don't, nothing created has the ability even the Elyon Shekebe Elyon, the highest of the highest, Lahasik, to understand this, Eich Kol HaOlamas Bechol Tzivam, how all of the worlds, all of the universe, Hema Be'etzim Ayin, they're really, they're really nothing. V'rak Kol Rega Hema Mishabun L'Metzias Mime, because of Hashem wills it into existence that it continues to exist. Therefore, Chazal trying to give us a small insight into that concept, use the name to refer to Hashem as Hamakom. So they're, they're trying, they're talking to, to, like as you would explain to a child, in the same way as you say, uh, a baby's in its mother's belly. So we know as adults, a baby's not in his mother's belly. It's not accurate. Yeah, but to a child, it allows the child to try to grasp the concept of what, what is that? Oh, there's a baby in mommy's belly. So Chazal use a language that we could try to grasp the concept we refer to him as Hamakom. He is simply the place in which existence 
can exist. Kaf, Kane, excuse me, Af Sheha Olam Kulo Murgash. And this is the line that we now need to, to highlight as we conclude this little section. Even though the world seems Vinidme and appears Kimitsius Bifne Atzmo as if it's its own reality. It, the world exists on its own. It doesn't need a Ribona Shalom. I haven't seen him anywhere, so it must be it exists on its own. Even to a believer, it looks like the world can exist on its own, and I have to sort of bring God into the world. No, 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 no. It's not that the world exists and we need to bring God into the world. It's that Hashem exists, and he brought the world, so to speak. He carved out a space for the world to exist. Therefore, even though it looks like the world is real, who is Baruch Shemo, who Mikomo, he is its place. Um, and, uh, okay, that's what we'll leave with here. Again, I, I, I end with what he began with of one really can't spend too much time in, in, involved in trying to understand this is beyond our ability. We'll leave it at that for now. Why is this relevant for our discussion tonight? Um, there's a there's the concept that the entire world, when you think about that little muscle of the dream, everything that exists in the world is part of the echad of Hashem. There is a oneness. There is something which unifies everything in existence. We don't experience the world that way. We don't see the world. We see the world as disparate, as so many different distinctions in the world, but it is at its core... Echad. Hashem is at his core, Echad, and the world that he created is that way. We don't see it that way. As we say, by Yom Hahu, Yihiyah Hashem Echad, Ushmo Echad. That day, there will be a day where Hashem will reveal himself, and he will be one, his name will be one, and we will see it that way. The example, I brought this example many times before, when you shine a light, a white light, pure light, through a prism, as it comes out through the other side of the prism and it's refracted, of course, we get the colors of the rainbow. If you existed on the other side of that prism, you would see the different colors. And if somebody told you, it's really, it's one. It all came from the same source. If you were only, if you never lived on the other side, you only lived in either the red or the yellow or the green spectrum, you, you couldn't even grasp the concept that it's only refracted light. That's your existence is that, no, it's red, it's yellow, it's green, they're different colors but there'll be a day where we will actually see the other side of the prism before it was refracted into the physical world in which we live, in which everything is actually a piece of Hashem, the light of Hashem that was refracted into the physical existence in which we live. But that means that even in this world that we live in, everything, everything that exists in this world is a piece, so to speak, of Hashem, or, or holiness, or reflects, let me say it in a way that's more accurate, that reflects a sanctity, a holiness of Hashem in this world, because it, it, it exists, and Hashem is the place in which the world exists. You can't have something that doesn't have a connection, some purpose in it. The Rosh Hashiva, as I'm sure I, all of you are struggling to, as I am, trying to grasp, as I said, let me, let me just give an example. We'll bring a, a, a single example to, uh, to explain this concept. And uh, he, he brings an example first from the Rambam and then from the Gemara. Um, and then we'll, we'll tie this back into Yaakov. The, the Rambam actually asks the, the following question based on, on these ideas. I, I just brought a number of sukkim actually, as I'm seeing the sheet, um, in which I, the number of sukkim reflect this idea in which Hashem says, uh, that, uh, hello, in source number six, and hello, Hashem, I need Male, I fill the whole. The heavens and the earth, the Adato Yom we say at the end of Aleinu, um, Ein Od. There is nothing other than Hashem. You were before the world, but after the world, nothing changes with the existence of the world. It is all, uh, it is all you. Anyway, the Rabbi asks the question in source number, source number 10. Says the Rabbi, nothing was created for naught. It doesn't exist that something was created and has no purpose. Can't be. And out of all the things that were created, the Rambam writes, the pinnacle and climax of creation is mankind, who has the ability to grasp that Hashem created everything and that we're here for a purpose, says the Rambam. But those people who are able to really understand the purpose of creation are few and far between. What sense do we make of all of the things which seem to serve 
no purpose in furthering Hashem's mission in this world. If you tell me as a fact, Hashem created the world and everything, there just seems to be so many things that it's like pretty hard to connect. What does this have to do with anything? How does this further quote Shemayim, bringing more honor and glory to Hashem in this world? We don't, we're lost in figuring that out. So the Rama brings an example. He says, well, you really never know. He says, and it's possible, he writes, that everything that was, in any particular thing that was created, was Lisharis, was there to serve a particular person who is furthering the purpose of creation. Ah, we never see that, says the Rambam. He says, I'll tell you a simple story. There once was a very wealthy uh, individual who was not involved in furthering Hashem's glory in the world, but he once commanded his uh, servants to build him a magnificent palace. And they spend all of this time and energy and effort uh, and resources building the palace. And 300 years later, uh, a, a pious Jew might be walking by and is uh, baking in the sun and needs some respite to be able to catch his breath. And will be able to use one of the walls of the, of the palace that was built uh, 200, 300 years before to provide himself with a little bit of shade and rest. And that palace was built there 300 years ago in preparation for something that will happen later. Now, simple little story. We sometimes see in our own lifetimes how that works. Most of the times we don't, but that things are put into motion. And it's very possible that we actually don't see, we have no idea how this furthers anything in the spiritual mission of the reason why Hashem created the world. But just know, just because we don't see it doesn't mean it's not there. And at some point, at some point it will become clear that that actually had a very specific purpose and served a mission in bringing about more kvod shamayim. That, that idea is the mission of Pirkei Abbas, that everything that Hashem created, everything that Hashem created in his world, created it for his honor. He created it to be able to bring more kvod shamayim. That's what the mission of Pirkei Abbas says. We don't always see it, but it's there, says the Rambam. So another example of this is the Gemara in the beginning of Masechah Savot Zara. The Gemara says that at the end of days, um, on source number 11, the Gemara says the Asad Lava, Hashem is going to take out his Sefer Torah, and he's going to say, all those who came and learned Torah, come now, I want to give you your reward for that which you've done, you've sat, you've studied, you've learned Torah, let me give you your reward. So the Gemara says, and all the nations of the world immediately come running in to say, okay, perfect, give us our reward. First up is Malchus Romi. The Romans are the first ones up in line. Hashem says to them, you, what are you guys doing here? Bamasaktem. What have you been busy with? What have you been learning? They say, what do you mean? What do you mean that we haven't been involved in the furthering the study of Torah? They say, Ribbonu Shalom, Harbe Shvokim Taknina. We built marketplaces. Harbe Merchzos, we built bathhouses. We amassed palaces filled with gold and silver. The Kulam and all of that, the bathhouses and the roads and the marketplaces and the architecture and the gold, everything that we did, we did it for the sake of the Jewish people that they could learn Torah better. We built nice buildings so that they'd have a nice base of Medrash to learn in. We taught them architecture so they could build themselves a nice school and a nice shul. We made bathhouses so that they could be clean and healthy and live longer and learn more Torah. That's why we did it. So therefore, we should get reward for the furthering of Torah learning in this world because we had a portion in it. So the Gemara, the Gemara says, Hashem looks at them and says, Fools, he says. Everything that you did, you did it for yourselves. Don't claim that you did it in order to further the Jewish people learning Torah and bringing more holiness to the world. That's not why you did it. You did it, fools, he said. You did it for yourselves. So says the Gemara. There's a wonderful story. Um, that reflects this, that the Rosh Hashiva quoted, uh, Reb, Chaim, uh, Reb Chaim Brisker, Reb Chaim Alevi, uh, was the founder of the Brisker form of learning, was once traveling from, uh, from somewhere to, to Valajan. Valajan was where the yeshiva was. He was going back to the, to the yeshiva. And he was traveling together with his son, Reb Velvel, and with his, their student, Reb Baruch Ber Leibowitz. And the story goes that the train had recently been built by the Russian Empire. This is before the First World War. Um, the Russians were uh, dealing with, Pol with Poland. 
they had certain uh, powers and control over Poland. And in order to be able to move men and armies faster from St. Petersburg to Warsaw, they built a train from one to the other. One of the stops along the train was right near the small little town of Volozhin. Volozhin, which was the seat of the yeshiva, um, where, uh, where everybody was going to learn. So Rav Baruch Ber says, as they're on the train, on the way to Volozhin, he said, you know, before the train was built, it was an arduous task for all of the students to get to the yeshiva in Volozhin. Now that there's a train and there happens to be a stop that's right near the yeshiva, but it cut down the travel time immensely. So Rav Baruch Ber quotes this Gemara to his rabbi, and he said, do you believe that the Russian empire, the czar is gonna get up to Shemaim after 120 years, and he's gonna claim, despite all the other problems that he's gonna have, he's gonna have, I built the train for the Jews to be able to get to the yeshiva. That's what the Gemara says, he's gonna claim basically. So he said, in the world of truth, Rav Baruch Ber asked his rabbi, I don't understand this Gemara. In the world of truth, the nations of the world are going to say, we did it for the Jews? That Hashem has to answer and say, fools, you did it for yourself. In the world of truth, you can't make up stories. How, how could they make that claim that they did it for us? So uh, Reb Chaim Alevi Brisker said, no, it's exactly right. They will. Because in the world of truth, it will come out that it's true. They did. They thought they were doing it to be able to control the pole. So they built a train station. The reality is they did. They built the train station so that there could be a stop right near the yeshiva in Volozhin, so that the students coming to learn would have an easier time. Hashem, when he answers them in the Gemara, doesn't say liars. He says fools. They're not lying when they said everything that we did, we did for the Jews. Because in the world of truth, it comes out, they look and they say, we understand with clarity everything that happened in the world was actually for a purpose of furthering the spiritual growth of the world. And down here, we don't see it. Down here, we think I'm doing, they thought they, they were doing this for that reason and this for that reason. But when we get to the world of truth, it will come out. They can say, look, it, <laughs> now we see looking back, we did all that for the Jews. He says, you're not a liar. It's true, but you can't claim credit for it if, if you thought you were doing it for yourself, you have to actually think you're living in this world for the sake of furthering the spiritual mission to get credit for that, despite the fact in reality that is what's happening. These ideas, Rosh Hashiva said, are an expression of Ein Od Milvado. There isn't anything else in the world other than his presence and the things that happen and take place in the world are reflections of the furthering of that mission. Sometimes we see it, sometimes not. But by Yom Ha'hu, there will be a day where Veniskov Hashem Levado. Hashem was the Makomo Shel Olam, the place in which the world exists. Every light in this world is really just a refraction of Hashem's light serving that purpose to make use of that, to see how it does that. One day we'll see Veniskov Hashem Levado Bayom Ha'u. I don't, I can't say anymore because I don't understand any more of those concepts, but I think that's enough for us to move on to section number two. Yaakov, where does Yaakov then fit in this moment, going back for Pachin Ketanim in terms of this picture that the Medrash puts together? One of my favorite Gemaras is a Gemara Masachas Nida. And the way that I like to introduce this Gemara is if, if you can imagine uh, the following scene, that before a child is born, there is a discussion up in heaven as to three specific elements, traits, characteristics, something about this child that are predetermined. Nothing to do with what the child will do in life, given to them, predestined three things. And I, this is one of my favorite questions to ask around the Shabbat, what would those three things be that would be decided up in Shemayim before a person is born? This is what you're going to have. This is what you're going to be. It's a great question. If we were sitting around a table, I would, we would pause, we would have, hear some ideas, but we're sitting over Zoom and you're all muted. So we're going to move forward and learn the Gemara together. The Gemara says in Masechus Nida as follows, it's source number 12. There's a Malach, so to speak, that's in charge of the, the newly formed fetuses, embryos, really, 
um, as, a, as a woman becomes pregnant, and so to speak, takes the little newly formed embryo and places it before the heavenly throne. Obviously, the Gemara is speaking in a language here that is just to, to demonstrate an idea, not for, for real. But so imagine this tipa, this small little forming embryo placed before the heavenly throne. The Omer Lefana, the Malach says before Hashem, looking at this embryo, this developing child, what's going to be with it? And the Gemara says three things are decided right then and there in the spot. Gibor o Cholash. Will it be strong or weak? Simple meaning is on a physical level. There are some people who are stronger, some who are weaker, some who are healthy, some who are less healthy throughout their lives. What's the status? What is this person's life going to be like? Is it going to be a strong and healthy life? Or will, unfortunately, the person be more sick and weak? Decided. Chacham o tipesh. Will he be wise or less wise? We would refer to that today as IQ. What's the IQ of the person going to be? Decided min shamayim before a person is born. What will the intelligent, the intellectual capabilities of the person be predetermined? And the third question, Ashir o Ani. What will his wealth be? What status will he have? We all know there are certain people, people go to the same programs, get the same jobs, and one person just seems to have everything they do turns to gold, another person just doesn't go. They're in the same socioeconomic status. Their whole lives, there's nothing they can do about it. And others, it's different. Some people are born into money, some people come into money, some people have less, have more determined. Now, in the same way, in the same way that intellectual capabilities, if you don't work on it, you, you won't make them flourish. So, so too with your money. If a person doesn't work on it, they might again. But there's going to be an amount that a person's going to have. It's determined mina shamayim, where, in what stratosphere a person will float in their economic life. Those three things are determined, says the Gemara. Your strength, healthy, not so healthy. Your wealth and your intelligence, decided in advance. The Gemara concludes one thing that's not decided, ilu rasha otzantik lo ka'amar. Nobody talks about whether or not the person will be righteous or wicked, because that is your mission in life. Hakol bidei shamayim, everything is decided from heaven. Chutz miyira shamayim. Fear of heaven is up to us. That's how much are we going to live in a spiritual way. That's what we do with it. That's up to us. This Gemara is a fascinating insight into the idea that we, every single person is given a mission. Every single person born has a job to do in this world that nobody else can do. The Sfas uh, the great Ger Rebbe, uh, had a beautiful phrase to describe, kol adam nivra al Every person has a specific mission, she'ein acher yochol l'sakno, that nobody else can do. It doesn't matter that that person, you look at them, they're so much better than me at everything. Might be true, they're better than you at everything but they can't do what you are put in this world to do. That There's no way. That's why you're here. Every single person has their unique mission. Within that mission, every single person has tools. We need a toolbox in order to succeed in life. What are the tools the Gemara says that we're given? We're given the tools of wealth, health, and intelligence. Every person has a different combination of those three traits. And the question is only, what do we do with the tools, excuse me, that we're given in this world? What do we do with our intelligence? Did we maximize it? Do we use it for what we're capable of? What do we do with our health, with our strength, our physical strength? And what do we do with our money? The fact that you have it, intelligence or money, is irrelevant. That not irrelevant. Isn't isn't you? Those are the tools that you were given with which to accomplish what you need to accomplish in life. All we're interested in is what you did with it, not whether or not you have it. It's, it's like a person walking around with their chest all that because they're a good looking person. You were born that way. The Rebbe Shalom blessed you with good looks. What does that have to do with you and why you were created? So too, you're blessed with money, you're blessed with strength, you're blessed with intelligence. That's not you. Those are the tools you're given. This is why we find in the Psukim to the, uh, a beautiful, beautiful pasuk back to our uh, sheets in source number uh, uh, 13. The pasuk says, now listen to these three things. Do not glorify you yourself, your, a wise one, with your wisdom. 
the Al Yishalel Hagibor Big Vuraso, the strong one should not glorify himself or praise himself with his strength. The Al Yishalel Ashir Be Asho, nor should the wealthy praise himself with his wealth. Those are the three things that are determined before you got to this world. You're going to praise yourself and say, look how great I am. I'm wealthy. I'm smart. I'm strong. It's not you. Ki halel With this should what person praise himself. Haskel v'yodea usi. He who knows me, that I am Hashem who does chesed and mishpat and staka, that's what I'm interested in. You're following in my ways with the tools that I gave you which is also why the famous mission in Perkei Elvis goes through these same three things. The, Gemara, the mission asks, Ezehu Chacham, who's considered a wise person? Why, do we, why isn't intelligence the answer? Because intelligence is a gift you were given. It's a tool. That's not what, we're not going to consider you a Chacham. A Chacham is what you do with it. Halome Mikol Adam. You learn from everyone. That's you. I want to learn. I want to grow. I want to get more knowledge. Oh, that's a Chacham. Your intelligence, that's a gift. Ezugibor, the Mishnah asks the same three things. Who's considered strong? It can't be physical strength. It's a gift you were given, just a tool to use. So who's really a strong person in the eyes of Judaism? A person who conquers his inclination, who's able to control himself. That's strength that has to do with who you are. And Ezu Ashir, who's considered wealthy, of course, is not how much money you have. That's just a gift you were given. It's Hasameh Bechel Kohi, who is happy with what he has. These same three ideas. Now, what does it mean that these are tools? That means that a, a, a sensitive Jew lives their life and says, every tool that I have is part of my mission. If I squander my intelligence, I'm missing something. I was, I, I was put in this earth to accomplish something. I was given a level of intelligence and I squandered it. I didn't do something with what I, I would feel. I, I didn't completely do it. I was what I'm capable of doing. I was given the tool and I wasted it. So too, if I don't use my, my whatever level of health a person has, and so it is with one's money. Every honest earned dollar is part of my mission. It's a tool that I was given. If I squander a dollar, if I waste money, all that I've done is taken a tool that I've been given and not use it. Now, I don't know what I was supposed to use it for, but if I throw it away, if I literally throw it away, flush it down the toilet, I can't possibly have used it for whatever mission it was supposed to be there for. Yaakov Avinu, in this moment, in this moment, sees there were certain things left behind. And he has a choice. He can say, forget it. Just leave it. Or he says, and teaches us, I didn't steal those plates. I bought them. They're mine. If I bought them, honestly, and they're mine, I need them. And if I'm missing them, then something in my life is going to be missing because my, my goal here is to take everything that I have and I yeah. use it as, as an expression of Kvot Shemayim, to bring a furtherance of the honor of Hashem in this world through the tools that I was given. I can't leave them behind there. Now, for a person to go back for a safer Torah, if a person were to go back because he left his tefillin, that doesn't express the idea that everything in the world can bring about more Kvot Shemayim. Of course you go back for your pair of tefillin that you forgot. Yaakov doesn't go back for that. He goes back for the pachin ketanim. Seeing in that also a means to an expression of bringing more kavod by fulfilling my purpose in this world. It's in that moment, the Medrash says, Vayivoser Yaakov Levado. In that moment, not just sitting and learning in the yeshiva of Shem Ve'ever for all those years, not just managing with love, but not even fighting with this angel. In going back and saying, Every tool that I've been given has to be utilized, maximized to express my purpose in this world, to bring more kavot Hashem in this world. I can't leave them. When he goes back and he's alone there, what does he express? The niskav Hashem levado. That is the connection the Medrash sees to the, there's going to come a day where Hashem alone will be exalted. Where we will see all the different colors of the spectrum that we live in 
after the world, so to speak, the physical world in which Hashem's light is refracted and we see so much divisiveness and difference and distinctions and we see maybe this is holy, that's not holy, this can be used. No, no, everything can be used. Yaakov, when he expresses that, that indeed everything can be used to raise up one's level of avodas Hashem and, and bring more kavod shemaim is an expression of what will one day be available to all of us the niskav Hashem levado, that Hashem alone will be exalted. And therefore, that's the medrash that we started with, uh, just to go back to the to end with that which we started, that uh, these two levados are together. Yaakov specifically in this moment, going back after the Pach and Ketanim, to the expression of Hashem's presence in this world, everything can be used to, to raise that up. Kol baruch everything that Hashem created in this world, L'chvodo bara was done for his glory and to bring more honor. And we have to find, utilize, and make sure that we maximize everything that we have in bringing that out to be Mikael, who is like Hashem, Yeshurun, like Yaakov was in seeing that specifically in this moment. I leave you with that thought. And Ritz Hashem will pick up uh, next week.